the DSO 152 through its pieces again today guys I'm going to use the same accessories we used before uh, just namely uh, a ground clip uh, t-pin adapter um, the mini coax connector to the standard BNC just so I can hook up to the uh, the Hantec HT 30A um, test harness here uh, to the uh, Fenersi uh, little scope so some of you guys will be getting fed up of actually seeing this sensor on my car, but I think it makes for a good uh, demonstration on the scope. Um, again, on my uh, Suzuki SX4, uh, I thought we'd look at the uh, cam position sensor. And on the schematics, again, I'm lucky enough to have the manual here. This is the cam position sensor here, item 4. You can see it is a three-wire Hall Effect sensor. Uh, you can see the three wires consists of a battery supply. So we'll have a 12-volt uh, internally in the engine control module itself. This is the engine control module. So internally, there's two different power supplies. There's 12-volt power supplies and 5-volt power supplies. So if you look at the schematic here, you can see what the Hall Effect sensor is. is essentially toggle. Um, the 5 volt power supply to and from ground so that way the ECM will know um, if we have high 5 volts or a near ground um, signal to the ECM uh, depending on the pulse uh, duration and um, orientation let's call it sequencing it'll know um, where the cam is and by knowing where the cam is indirectly it'll know where the uh, uh, the crank is and of course the piston position right now. There is of course a crank position sensor on the SX4 as well. It is um, um, An induction type sensor It is not Hall effect uh, Strangely enough, they've got two different types. You would expect them to be Maybe similar but Suzuki for whatever reason haven't gone that way It's an induction type uh, crank sensor and a Hall effect cam sensor. We'll only look at the cam sensor today so the three wires, um, just to finish the thought on that, is a 12 volt supply, a 5 volt uh, internally regulated uh, 5 volt reference, which is toggled to and from ground via the uh, Hall Effect uh, position uh, sensor itself. And of course there is a ground. So there'll be three wires on the sensor. So let's look at the sensor. Here, as you can imagine, is the, you know, underneath the plastic um, air induction box is the uh, intake manifold itself uh, in there in the uh, the cam cover is of course the camshaft itself at the end of the run here right so at the end of the run here this is the cam sensor i think you can see it is a 90 degree sensor that goes down inside the, uh, the casting uh inside the uh inside there of course the camshaft itself but at the end of the camshaft is actually a reluctor wheel a toothed wheel or a trigger wheel whatever you want to call it and it's the proximity of those teeth that are sensed via the hall effect sensor and toggle the signal to and from ground again the duration and sequencing of the pulses is what's important and we'll see that on the scope okay so we have three wires to try and make sense of here we have the black and the red we have a, a red and a yellow and a black and a orange. I know you can't really see the orange tracer there, guys, but it is there on the other wire. Let's see if we can make sense of this. Not to over explain the setup, guys, but some guys are brand new to the using the uh, introductory scope like this, as you can imagine. So take a moment to explain it. So the uh, one lead is just simply going to battery negative. And then our other lead is going to be used with the adapter for the purposes of back probing the connector on the scope itself. Set up. Uh, I have uh, 5 volts per division. We'll change that once we get into the, uh, the cam signal itself. But initially, just leave it on 5 volts per division. Uh, no need for an attenuator. Time base, uh, 20 milliseconds uh, per division. DC coupled, right? So uh, we'll worry about the trigger when we actually get there. Uh, the connector itself here guys now i have the wiring diagram you may not but it's not difficult to actually figure out which wire is which my ignition is in the run position so we have power to the uh, uh, appropriate wiring on the connector here without it you won't have anything right so we've got three wires to try and figure out which is which once again just to establish that we have uh, the integrity of our our test harness is fine here guys i'm just going to go to battery positive here you can see the lift on the trace yeah Okay, so let's go to the connector itself. See what we can see. So 
there's the uh, 12 volts. So the black and the red is the 12 volts. Sorry about the flash, but I'm trying to split the difference between you being able to see the connector and the, and the screen. Let's go to the other black and orange. The black and the orange doesn't lift us off the ground line. So just a word about this, guys, right? Depending on where the uh, trigger wheel has actually stopped on a high or a low, the uh, Hall effect sensor may be putting out um, the 5 volt trace or the zero line. So it might be a wee bit difficult to distinguish between the, uh, the zero line on the trace or the signal output and the actual ground line, right? So anyway, that's zero. Let's keep that in mind. We'll get, get back to that in a minute. And let's look at this line here. Let's see what it brings us. And it's at zero as well. So this is what I'm trying to explain to you. It may be difficult to distinguish the ground line from just a low on the Hall effect. So to make the distinction on the connector here, guys, let's actually start the car and then we'll revisit those two pins there. We know that the 12 volt reference is on uh, the 12 volt supply is on the black and red here. That much we have figured it. The other two pins, if we didn't have the wiring diagram at the, at the moment, we're uncertain. Put the car pin here. Zero line there, so I suspect that is the ground. Let's go to the middle one here. The red and the uh, yellow, and there we'll see what we have to say. We went low. Let's adjust the uh, let's adjust the uh, amplitude scaling, the voltage scaling, and we'll get a wee bit clearer image. And we'll adjust the trigger so it's not walking across the screen. So. I've adjusted uh, some of the parameters on the scope here, guys, and I've, I've learned a few things here um, that you're gonna have to cope with. Again, a $20 scope is not really exactly optimized, right? So I've changed the um, uh, volts per division on the voltage scaling or amplitude to one volt. Again, there's no attenuation, of course. Let me move that so you can see a bit clearer. I'm at 100 milliseconds uh, per division at the moment, just so you can see that we do have a, uh, pulse train basically here uh, because of the scaling it is a zero to five volts the pulse is right and of course we're in run mode we're in auto at the moment here guys right if you go to uh, normal in order to stabilize the image here um, it's going to limit you to uh, 10 milliseconds per division and i'll show you uh, when we change the time base here at 10 milliseconds per division you're not going to be able to capture the whole uh, picture here and we'll reference that to the manual with respect to the whole picture. So let me continue to show you what I mean here. So let me just take the uh, time base down. Clearly we're, uh, we're looking at too much time here. Sorry. I'm trying to look at this through the camera here, guys. Sorry, it was clearly in the coupling. I changed the coupling there and not the time base. Let me change the time base. 50 milliseconds per division. Okay, that's making a bit more sense, a bit clearer image. Let's go a wee bit further down, 20 milliseconds per division. So that's pretty good. Um, you can see we've got a bit of quiver because of the nature of this pulse train. Uh, we've got a bit of quiver in the train here, but let me go in normal here for a second in the uh, trigger and you'll see we're at 10 milliseconds. I'll try and go a bit faster. And I can't, I can't go above 10 milliseconds because I'm in the normal mode of triggering. I guess that has uh, got something to do with the resolution and the little scope itself. But if I go back to, uh, if I go back to auto, back to run, I can uh, change the time base back to 20 milliseconds again here. And at 20 milliseconds, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and capture an image. That's pretty close, but let me carry on here. Toggling between run and stop mode here for a reason, guys. Okay, let me stop right here. The reason I've captured this particular image in the stop mode is so I can reference this to the manual. Okay, let's take a look at the manual reference waveform in the manual if you're troubleshooting the various subsystems you can use these reference waveforms to see if your car is behaving 
um, like a typical um, serviceable car should, right? So you can see in this particular instance, this reference waveform is giving us um, two traces on here. This is the cam position sensor output, and this is actually the crank sensor. Again, this is an inductive type sensor, so the nature of the waveform is quite different. What we want to focus on here is the cam, okay? So let's see uh, the cam as a pulse train, and you can see that there is a bit of a signature on the pulse train itself. You can see we have a, a single uh, pulse, and then we have a single pulse and a narrow pulse, single pulse and a narrow pulse, and then a single pulse. And then this repeats. The notation on the drawing here is actually shown. I'm trying to get the lighting right so you can see the scope and the manual here, guys. Uh, so bear with me here. So I, number three here, there's a notation that's telling you that, that is th 360 degrees of crank angle, right? So keep in mind, the cam shaft, of course, uh, rotates once for every two rotations of the crank, right? So you have to keep that ratio in mind. But shown on here, um, if this is 360 degrees, can you appreciate that that distance again, guys, is actually going to be another 360 degrees. And this pulse here is this pulse here. Right, so that would be 270 degrees of uh, crank rotation or one full rotation of the camshaft. Right, so let's compare the reference drawing to what we actually managed to capture on the uh, on the DSO uh, 152 here. For nursey, for nursey, I don't know, the 152, let's call it right, keep things simple here. So, again, guys. Um, you have to kind of manage the graticule, the resolution, and the time base, right? Now, I would have preferred a slightly wider um, pulse, so a slightly faster uh, time base on here. But when I went to 10 milliseconds per division, I couldn't see the whole story here, meaning that I couldn't see um, 370, or sorry, 360 de degrees rotation of the uh, camshaft or 720 degrees of rotation of the uh, crank so i wanted to be able to capture that and you can see here that we actually have this right so there's the there's the single uh pulse there's a single and a narrow single and a narrow and then back to a single so the firing order on the uh, sx4 is um one three four two and that's basically what we're looking at here is the top dead center positions exactly where on the pulse. I'm not sure, guys. The manual doesn't spec that out. But that's basically what we're looking at here is top dead center for cylinders. One, three, four, two. So that is um, um, that's all the cylinders there. And by the time we're back to this pulse here, that is the same pulse as as this one here guys so this pattern would repeat again because of course the trigger wheel is just unchanging and rotating so this this pattern is going to repeat uh, so long as the engine is actually running this is how the engine control module can discern the position of each uh, cylinder with respect to the uh, position of the engine and its internal components and operation and then of course it can time the uh, ignition and the fuel injectors and and everything else for that matter that has to uh, cope with right so this um pattern here that we were able to capture on the dso 152 is in fact identical although the presentation is a wee bit different strictly because of the graticule on this particular reference trace and what we have available with respect to um, the dso 152 Keep in mind, guys, um, I could not attain uh, to, uh, sorry, 20 milliseconds per division when I was in the normal mode of operation. Can't explain that. It is just um, a characteristic of the DSO-152 that you'll have to live with, right? If you're looking for longer time bases, come out of the normal trigger mode of operation, go into auto, and then it allows you longer time bases. But other than that, that's pretty decent, right? Um, 
I could have spent more time and showed you at 10 milliseconds per division, the resolution is better, clearer, um, but for the sake of capturing the whole story here, again, uh, 360 degrees of rotation of the cam from here to here. And of course that same 360 degrees of rotation of the cam represents 720 degrees of rotation of the crankshaft or one full four stroke cycle, as you can imagine. Right back to the same um, number one top dead center with respect to the, the four stroke cycle. So I hope that's all makes sense, guys. Um, again, I have the luxury of having the manual worth absolutely every penny. I recommend it doesn't matter whether you have an SX4, whatever car you have, spend the 20 bucks, 25 bucks, get yourself a PDF copy online, download it worth absolutely every penny. No, every no, no, every manual is going to be this. Um, comprehensive you know no every manual is going to give you reference waveforms but i'm fortunate to have these and again it makes good sense that you can use these correlate what's going on with your car versus the laboratory uh rat uh, that suzuki has uh, published here for us and then uh, if there's an anomaly you can try and figure out what's going on now beyond the scope of this little video here guys is well what we don't have this right but this is just to show you more or less the DSO 152's capacity and it can in fact capture um, pretty decent trace for you. So I just took a snapshot of the uh, the trace here guys on my phone here and um, I just thought I would show you. Um, it's not just a trace, you know, a static trace that doesn't mean anything. This is real time data and how can you correlate this with the real world and make it make any kind of sense at all, right? So if you recall, the time base was 20 milliseconds per division. So let's take our reference pulse here, which is the number one cylinder, and let's count. So that's 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 20, 40, 60, and I'm gonna say about 165-ish milliseconds until it repeats from this point here and to this point here. So keep in mind, this is obviously gonna be a function of how fast the engine is actually rotating, the rotational speed of the engine, right? So we're at idle here, guys, and I can tell you definitively, when the car's warmed up and it's idling, typically it's about 730 RPM, right? So you can take this duration, this delta T from here to here, 165 milliseconds, and use this formula here, right? So 60,000, not an arbitrary number. There's 60,000 milliseconds in a minute, right? RPM is revolutions per minute. Take the interval, the delta T, 165 milliseconds. So let's just write this in, 165. And then we're gonna times it by two because don't forget the cam is rotating at half the speed of the crank, right? So we need to times it by two. So if you do the math here, let's do the math. So there you go, amazing. Uh, very close to the 730 RPM uh, guesstimate that I made for the idle speed, yeah? Uh, not magic, basic mathematics. You have to know the limitations, you have to know how to manipulate the stop and uh, run mode, you have to know how to operate the uh, different time bases relative to what trigger mode you're in. You have to kind of strike a balance between everything here. Again, you're dealing with a $20 oscilloscope, guys, but to me, that's not bad and certainly usable. That's it, boys. Cheers.